welcome back to the Classics Capsule with me, Sean McKeonan. Today we are going to look at a series of films that wasn't actually intended to be a series, it was originally going to be a standalone one-off movie. And it was such a success at the box office that the directors who, and the writers then thought we're onto something, so let's expand it a little bit more which gave them a whole range of problems, as we'll see. The film series is Back to the Future, and it's written by Robert Zemeckis and Bob Gale, and the actual main idea of it came from Bob Gale, and he conceived it after he had visited his parents, and he found his father's old school yearbook and his father had been the class president, which is something that he never knew. But he also then realised he never knew his own class president when he'd been at school. And then started thinking, I wonder if I, if I had known my father when he was a teenager, would we have been friends? So he came up with an idea of how you could get a teenager from the mid-1980s to go back to when his parents were going to be teenagers and that immediately led him to the time period of the early to mid 50s just mathematically. He sat down with Robert Zemeckis and they came up with an idea of an American teenager who is befriended by a mad scientist who has created a time machine and who ends up being blasted back to the 1950s and then has the problem of getting back home again. That is where the thing started and then the problems began. Because every single one of the major studios in Hollywood turned it down flat. And both Zemeckis and Gale were friends with Steven Spielberg and they showed him the script in 1980 when he wrote it. And Spielberg read it and he absolutely loved it and he offered there and then to get the film made and both Zemeckis and Gale refused because they didn't want to be seen to be people who could only get a job because they were friends with Spielberg, they wanted to do it on their own bat. So Robert Zemeckis went off and directed a film with Michael Douglas called Romancing the Stone which was Zemeckis' first solo major box office hit. And once that was done, once he had that success behind him, very suddenly the studio started to take an interest in him and in his own individual projects. So they then went back to Spielberg and asked him would he be prepared to make a film with them and he said I'll only do it on one condition and that is we do that time travel film that you wrote a couple of years ago. So they went to Columbia Pictures, who this time agreed, yes, we will do this. Then the work started to refine the script, and this is where a number of problems immediately came to light, because the first draft of the script had the time machine being a refrigerator. And both Zemeckis and Gale, when they read this again, and Spielberg read it, and the three of them all realised that if you show a film with a time machine being a refrigerator, with people climbing and out of the refrigerator, you're going to get kids trying to do the same thing, and you could end up with kids being frozen to death, locking themselves in a fridge. So, it was immediately decided they needed to change the time machine. That was the first major decision. The next problem that they had was budgetary in that they had to find a way to get back from the 1950s and the original script had the time machine needing the power of an atomic blast and the climax took place at the Nevada test site as a nuclear explosion is detonated and then the power of that is harnessed and fed back into the time machine and that goes far as being costed and when the budgetary figures came through they realised there was never in a million years they were going to be able to afford to do it so they had to find a simple way to get back from the 1950s to the 1980s. Robert Zemeckis then decided that he wanted the time machine to be mobile. So 
that then led to is it going to be something like an aeroplane or is it going to be something like a car and there is a, an absolutely wonderful joke in the script when Marty McFly the teenage character arrives in 1955 and he plows into a farmer's barn and the car is mistaken for a flying saucer and he's mistaken for an alien because he's in a radiation suit and it was decided to use a DeLorean because it looks futuristic in the 1980s but to the 1950s people it could conceivably be mistaken for a flying saucer so it was decided there and then that the time machine is a DeLorean that's it so that then starts off. Then they came up with the idea of how to get it back to use a bolt of lightning and uh, then to channel the power of the lightning, the 1.1 gigawatts of electricity that would be needed into the car. They kept the idea of it originally being a, a radioactive source for the first trip back to 1955 and it being a plutonium source which the scientist character has stolen from some Libyan terrorists, which immediately dates the film <coughs> to the early to mid 1980s, when America and Libya were not exactly the best of friends. The script all got passed, everybody was happy, and then a legal issue arose because Colombia were looking to remake a film called Double Indemnity, the rights for which were owned by Universal. And they were terrified that Universal were going to put a stop to this film. So there was a telephone call made to one of the executives at Universal who used to work for Columbia. And the executive at Universal knew of the Back to the Future project, he knew of the script and he loved the script. So he traded off the rights for Double Indemnity for the rights to Back to the Future. So the whole project then transferred from Columbia across to Universal, who agreed to distribute the film. Steven Spielberg produced it through his own Amblin production company, and then the whole thing was given a green light with a budget of $11 million. And then they started to cast the film, and this is where a whole minefield of issues came up. Zemeckis, as the director, had a, an ideal list of who he wanted and his first choice for the teenage character Marty McFly was Michael J Fox but Michael J Fox at the time was under contract to an American situation comedy named Family Ties and one of his co-stars in 1984 uh, Meredith Baxter was away on maternity leave and Family Ties producer was very reluctant to lose two members of the cast so he vetoed any idea of Michael J. Fox going into a film which would have meant him having to take time off from, back, from family ties. Zemeckis then started looking around and he had his attention drawn to a film which hadn't at that point been released called Mask, which features an absolutely stunning performance by a young actor, well he was young at the time, Eric Stoltz. And Zemeckis was impressed enough to meet Stoltz and he was actually third choice on Zemeckis' own list but having met him and seen his performances in the film he offered the part to him there and then and Eric Stoltz accepted it. The next principal role to be cast was the mad scientist who at this point was Professor Emmett Brown and the original choice for that was John Lithgow who was unavailable, uh, he had a number of other projects going on and he just nowhere in a million years could he have gone anywhere near this. So Zemeckis at that point was a little bit panic stricken and he had his attention drawn to an actor named Christopher Brown. Lloyd. Sorry, Christopher Lloyd. I'm getting mixed up with the character name. Uh, Christopher Lloyd, very, very well known from a hysterical situation comedy named Taxi when he played a completely off the wall character named Pastor um, Jack. Reverend Jim. Jim. And uh, he was very reluctant to take the part on, he didn't want to do it at all. Uh, 
but his wife insisted that he at least read the script and he read the script and thought yes there's something in it so christopher lloyd relatively fresh from trying to kill captain kirk in star trek 3 comes across to play professor brown then Professor Brown was altered to Doc Brown because it was felt that Doc Brown sounded a little bit better than Prof Brown. So we then have the two main characters. Originally, Doc Brown was supposed was going to have a pet chimp, and Steven Spielberg vetoed that on the idea that a chimp would be completely uncontrollable in a film studio and on a film set. So. The chimp was changed to a pet dog. The next problem that they then had was that Universal then turned around and said, we don't want the title to be Back to the Future. We want it to be called Spaceman from Pluto. To mimic and image the idea that when Marty McFly goes back to 1955, he is mistaken for being a spaceman from Pluto. Uh, Spielberg in particular didn't like that particular idea but Universal's argument was that no successful film has ever had future in the title so we don't want this to have future in the title otherwise it's not going to work very similar idea to what George Lucas had experienced when he was trying to get Star Wars and originally have the word walls in the title of that Spielberg's intervention basically shamed Universal into accepting the fact that it is going to be called Back to the Future. Um, he actually convinced them that they thought it was a joke when they were saying we wanted it to be called Spaceman from, from Pluto. They then started to make the film and this is when a whole range of issues then started to arrive. They had cast the sort of principal villain, such as he is, a character called Biff Tannen, on the, the basis of Eric Stoltz playing the role. Now, Zemeckis had originally cast an actor in that name, J.J. Cohen, on the idea that Michael J. Fox is going to be playing Marty McFly, and so he cast Biff Tannen first. Then, when, Mar when Michael J. Fox became unavailable, and Eric Stoltz was cast and they saw Stoltz and Cohen next to each other. They realised that J.J. Cohen, although he could perform the role, he wasn't physically intimidating enough to be a believable bully against Marty McFly now. So they recast Biff Tannen with an actor named Thomas F. Wilson, who was actually a, a more of a stand-up comedian at the time. He hadn't done that much acting. But he is an absolute bear of a man in those days, very, very tall, very, very muscular, and he towered over Eric Stoltz and looked like he could physically intimidate him. J.J. Cohen was offered the part of one of Biff Tannen's gang members and accepted that role instead. The film starts production, it starts filming, everything's going very, very well until four weeks in, Zemeckis and Spielberg looked at some of the rushes and realised that Eric Stoltz was not giving a performance that could be described as comedic. He was a very good dramatic actor and it was a very good dramatic performance, but he was missing a lot of the comedy and the comedy was being missed as a result of that. It then came to light that Eric Stoltz had already spoken to Universal Pictures and said that he wasn't comfortable in the film uh, and he felt that he was wrong for it as well. And that conversation had taken to place two weeks before Zemeckis and Spielberg had come to their decision that they got the cast and wrong. As a result of that, they then went away and looked at the budgets and they realised that if they were to recast at this point, it was going to add another $3 million onto the, the budget of the film because they'd have to reshoot everything that had already been done at that point. But for the good of the film, it was decided that that is what they had to do. So Eric Stoltz very gracefully dropped out of the film. And they then went back to the production team of Family Ties. And between 
an awful lot of negotiations that went on. The deal was done for Michael J. Fox to work on Family Ties during the day and then go and work on Back to the Future at night and have approximately four and a half hours sleep each night in between then going back to doing Family Ties, then going back to doing Back to the Future. They then went back to reshoot the films that had been done with Eric Stoltz and they immediately noticed a very unusual problem in that Christopher Lloyd is six foot one inches tall and Michael J. Fox is five feet four. And there was such an apparent height difference between the two of them that they instructed Christopher Lloyd to play Doc Brown with a very noticeable hunch. Just purely and simply so they could get the two of them on camera with the faces at not exactly the same level, but they could get the two of them on sh in shot at exactly the same time, rather than have to cut from one to the other. Crispin Glover uh, was cast as George McFly, who's Marty McFly's father. And the absolute ironic thing about that is that Marty McFly, or Michael J. Fox, is actually three years older than Crispin Glover, Michael J. Fox being born in 1961 and Crispin Glover was born in 1964. <laughs> uh, it was, as I said, it was originally designed as a standalone film and when, as they were making the thing, Christopher Lloyd went away and spoke to some genuine physicists and he had originally been directed to say the energy of the electricity needed as a gigawatt and he was instructed by a physicist that you wouldn't say gigawatt it would be gigawatt so he came back and said I'm going to pronounce this gigawatt because that is how a scientist would actually pronounce it <coughs> and then the whole idea of the a lightning bolt striking the clock tower in the town square was concocted in 1955 so it was right we're going back to 1955 that and that electricity bolt is going to be how the thing gets back to the 1980s the film was released in america late 1984 it was released in britain in 1985 and it was an absolute smash hit in the box office as a result of the success of Back to the Future, Universal Pictures immediately started to clamour for a sequel to be made, which both Zemeckis and Gale were very reluctant to do. However, uh, they gave in to the pressure and they started to write a sequel and immediately realised that they'd given themselves a major problem in that at the end of Back to the Future, Doc Brown comes for Marty McFly because the kids are completely screwing up in the future, Marty McFly and his girlfriend Jennifer, who in the future are married and have kids and the kids are basically making a mess of their lives. And Back to the Future finishes with the three of them blasting off to a year. You don't even know what year it is that they're going to. But when they sat down to start writing Back to the Future 2, they realized that they had a major problem now because Jennifer was an extra body who had to be built into the storyline and they couldn't just go and have a simple straightforward adventure because of that. So the first decision that was made was we need somehow to sideline Jennifer as much as we possibly can and carry on concentrating purely and simply on Doc Brown and Marty McFly. So the film takes place in 2015 and Zemeckis, the one condition that he stipulated was that he would do the sequel provided Michael J. Fox and Christopher Lloyd both agreed to return. Christopher Lloyd was the first one who they approached and he said he would do it provided Michael J. Fox agreed to go back and do it. Michael J. Fox in it, on his part he was very keen to return to the, the series. So they had the two principles in place. Then they had a, a, a very unexpected problem that Claudia Wells, who had played Jennifer in the original Back to the Future film, 
initially said that she was prepared to go back, but then she had a number of personal issues built up in her life, and so she had to drop out of the film. And she was replaced by Elizabeth Shue, who actually bears quite a strong resemblance to Claudia Wells, but not strong enough to immediately get away with it. So the first thing they had to do was go back and reshoot the ending of the original Back to the Future film with Elizabeth Shue. Then they realised we've got a bit of a problem now because Elizabeth Shue, even at that point, was a considerably well-known actress and it wasn't really right to cast somebody in very much a small role. So they expanded the part ever so slightly, so that as well as playing young Lorraine in 2015, she also plays old Lorraine as well, under very, very heavy prosthetic makeup. Then, as the film carries on, she is written out, but it's a very logical way how they stop using it. The next problem that they then had was every single one of the principal characters from the original film, the original actors, all agreed to come back, except for Crispin Glover. Uh, Crispin Glover was incredibly put out by the fact that the salary that he was offered to go back to do Back to the Future 2 was less than half what the other returning actors had been offered. And he asked for parity with the other returning actors, which Zemeckis flatly refused to do. So as a result of that, they had to recast George McFly and they cast an actor named Jeffrey Weissman, who then had to wear a lot of prosthetics to make him bear even the slightest resemblance to Crispin Glover. And then they obscured him in a number of completely bizarre ways, like they had him hanging upside down on a, a, a sort of gravity thing because he's put us back out playing golf, all standing in the background, delivering lines, wearing glasses or sunglasses. Crispin Glover, when he found out what they were doing, promptly sued Universal Pictures and Robert Zemeckis and Steven Spielberg and Bob Gale, stating that they do not own his likeness and it is therefore not right that they are making another actor up to look like him to play this character. And as bizarre as it sounds, he actually won the lawsuit. And as a result of that, the Screenwriters Guild now states that under the bargaining terms and conditions, if an actor has to drop out for whatever reason, methods such as those used in Back to the Future 2 can never be used again to replace the original actor. It does not apply if the actor is dead, which is how Disney got away with recreating Peter Cushing in the Star Wars spin-off film Rogue One, but that is something that we'll look at when we look at the Star Wars films in the future. Michael J. Fox in Back to the Future 2 plays Marty McFly again as the teenager. He also plays Marty McFly as a 47 year old. He also plays his own son, Marty Jr. as a 15 year old. And he also plays his daughter, Marlene, with a, 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 a performance that it, it's, it's not on screen for very long, but it's got to be seen to be believed because it is so funny in what he does. It is absolutely brilliant and those little sequences are actually one of the best parts of the entire film. Now, the, the plot of Back to the Future 2 isn't as simple and as straightforward as the original film. Uh, there's an awful lot of time hopping backwards and forwards from 1985 to 2015 where Biff Tannen is now an old man. And he steals the time machine to go back to 1955 with a sports almanac and gives it to his younger self in 1955 and then brings the time machine back to 2015 and promptly keels over and dies of a heart attack. Biff Tannen in the 1950s then uses the sports almanac to place bets on a number of sport results, which he already knows the results of, becomes very, very rich and becomes corrupt. And you then get an alternative version of 1985, which 
Doc Brown, Marty and Jennifer go back to. They then have to go back to 1955 to put right the damage to the time continuum. The, the whole thing, it's too confusing for its own good. That is the, the major problem the film has. And it also has a major, major hole in the plot. In that, in the original Back to the Future film, Doc Brown has to explain in minute detail to Marty McFly how to operate the DeLorean as a time machine. And yet, in 2015, Biff Tannen is able to get into this DeLorean and operate it as a time machine to go back to 1955 and then go back to 2015 without any instructions whatsoever. That one thing just makes the whole film not make the slightest bit of sense whatsoever. Or plutonium. Now, the gap around the, the, the plutonium, at the end of the Back to the Future film, it has a fusion reactor on the back of it that feeds off garbage. So, it's sort of like the ultimate in recycling, really. But uh, the, the whole... But they don't know the, that. The, the whole idea... It, it, it's a clever idea, but that one sort of plot device that they needed it just doesn't make the slightest bit of sense, and as such, the film doesn't make that much sense. But it does give a very neat lead into Back to the Future 3 at the end of it, when Doc Brown is apparently blown up in the DeLorean by the same lightning storm that sends Marty McFly back to 1985 in the original Back to the Future film. And... While Marty McFly is standing on the road, having just seen the DeLorean apparently be vaporised, somebody from the Western Union arrives with a letter for him from 1885, written to him by Doc Brown. Instructing him under no circumstances is he to go back to 1885 to, to find him and to bring him back to 1985. So... That is where Back to the Future 2 finishes, with that cliffhanger, what's going to happen. There was a three week gap between production of Back to the Future 2 and Back to the Future 3. The two of them were made pretty much back to back over a period of 11 months. And as a result of that, when they were making Back to the Future 3, Back to the Future 2 was still being edited. So Robert Zemeckis, basically ended up doing what Michael J. Fox had done on the original Back to the Future film, in that he would, during the day, he'd be in Monument Valley with the cast, making Back to the Future 3. Then at the end of the day shooting, he would then get on a plane to Burbank to watch the edited rushes of Back to the Future 2, get a few hours sleep, and then get back on a plane and fly back to Monument Valley for the shooting of Back to the Future 3 the following day. That was done the whole way through. Now, that was not the only problem that Back to the Future 3 had. Uh, Doc Brown has a love interest in the film, which is a, ever such a slight rip-off of a film called Time After Time, in which a woman from the 20th century falls in love with a time traveller from the 19th century. Back to the Future 3 has a woman from the 19th century fall in love with somebody from the 20th century. Time After Time features a performance by an actress in that role, namely Mary Steenbergen, who had the role of Clara Clayton in Back to the Future 3 written specifically for her. It's thought as a direct homage to Time After Time. The slight problem was that Mary Steenbergen received the script, read it and hated it and had absolutely no intention of doing it whatsoever. She only agreed to do it because her kids had loved the original Back to the Future film and basically hounded her to the point where she had to accept the part. The rest of the cast all fell into place. Christopher Lloyd, again, Doc Brown, Marty McFly, again, Michael J. Fox. The three old timers in the 
saloon in the, the, the Western Times were a nod to the original Western films in that they cast Pat, Pat Buttram, Harry Casey Jr and Dirk Taylor who were all veterans of Westerns from the 1940s and 1950s sitting in the bar merrily getting completely hammered out of their heads on the whiskey that used to be served in those times. The dance sequence, the music for the, the dance sequence at the big party for Hill Valley basically virtually being founded was played live on the set and the musicians were played by a musical group who were quite big at the time, an American group named ZZ Top, uh, all dressed in 19th century clothing and they play a country and western style riff over and over and over and over and over and over again and Murray Steenbergen during the dance sequences got a little bit too enthusiastic and tore a ligament in her foot which led to a break in film and while that healed up because she could barely walk. The scenes where she could do sitting down they did them but a lot of the scenes had to be completely rescheduled as did a lot of scenes for Michael J. Fox, who sadly lost his father during the production of Back to the Future 3, and then subsequently his son was born, so he was given time off for that as well. The film very nearly went badly wrong when a stunt, which Michael J. Fox, for reasons known only to himself, insisted on doing himself, uh, Marty McFly is lassoed by Biff Tannen's great-great-grandfather, Buford Tanner, and dragged along the streets of Hill Valley to the courthouse, which is still being built. But Buford Tannen decides we're going to have a hanging, and it was at this point where Michael J. Fox took over from the stuntman who had just been getting pulled all around the streets. And Michael J. Fox was suspended by his neck on a rope and Bob Zemeckis, Thomas F. Wilson and the rest of the cast all genuinely thought Michael J. Fox was acting. He wasn't. The thing had gone badly wrong and the, the support that was supposed to hold him hadn't worked and he was genuinely being suspended by his neck about 20 feet up in the ground until the rope was released as part of the scene which is then where he meets Doc Brown again because it's Doc Brown who shoots through the rope with a telescopic rifle that he's made himself. Rather than take a break, Michael J. Fox then insisted on carrying on with the next scene and the voice that he has is genuine where he can barely speak. He, he, he is croaking his lines and it's because of the, how tight this rope had gone. Um, he had apparently been on the point of losing consciousness before the rope was released. It was a very, very dangerous situation, but you know the, it, he insisted on doing the scene himself, and it, it, it went wrong and very, very nearly caused a tragedy. Oh, as well as Marty McFly, Michael J. Fox also plays one of his own ancestors, Seamus McFly. And while Michael J. Fox is a very good comedy actor and a very good dramatic actor, whoever told him he could do an Irish accent, just... It's, nearly, it's very nearly as bad as Dick Van Dyke's attempt at a Cockney accent in Mary Poppins. Not to be outdone, Leah Thompson, who plays Lorraine McFly, Marty McFly's mother, also plays one of Marty's ancestors, Maggie McFly, Seamus' husband, and again, her Irish accent leaves a great deal to be desired as well. But at least the plot of it makes some sort of sense and it, it, it's the sort of film where you can just basically just sit back and just switch your brain off Back to the Future 3 and just enjoy it for what it is. It's just pure escapism, very much along the lines of the original Back to the Future film. It's pretty obvious throughout it that Michael J. Fox and Christopher Lloyd are both having an absolute whale of the time. Christopher Lloyd especially is just wallowing in the fact he can go as far over the top as he wants and get away with it. Box office wise it performed better 
than Back to the Future 2, but not as well as Back to the Future. And it brought the whole saga to a conclusion where at the very end of the film, the DeLorean comes back to 1985 along a railway track and is probably smashed by an oncoming train. And the film finishes with Doc Brown reappearing, having got married to Clara, and with two boys named Jules and Verne, in honour of their, both of their favourite authors, Jules Verne, on a steam locomotive which they have built as a time machine, uh, which is powered on steam. That then blasts off into some other time. Again, you don't know where they're going. And ever since then, there has been talk of a Back to the Future 4. I doubt very much if Back to the Future 4 ever actually happens. They'll have to go to a Hollywood icon in Clint Eastwood and ask for permission to use his name in the way that they did with Back to the Future 3 when Martin McFly introduces himself to everybody as Clint Eastwood. And basically, the name Clint Eastwood just has the name, the, the mickey taken out of it right the way through the film. In fairness to the producers, they did go to Clint Eastwood, told him what they were going to do and asked him if he was okay with it and he actually thought it was an absolutely hysterical idea and went along with it and absolutely gloried in the whole thing. Another big fan of the Back to the Future films was the ex-American president, and he was the American president at the time of the original Back to the Future, Ronald Reagan, who when he was watching the original Back to the Future film for the first time, and there's the wonderful joke in 1955, where Christopher Lloyd asks Marty McFly, who's the president of America in your time? And Michael J. Fox immediately responds, Ronald Reagan, which gets the incredulous response from Doc Brown, what, the actor? Reagan, when he saw that for the first time, had the film stopped and ordered the projectionist to rewind the film so he could watch it again. He thought that the joke was that funny. Now, going forward, there are a lot of rumours that Back to the Future is going to be rebooted and all done again with a completely new cast, which Zemeckis has vetoed. He's not prepared to allow that to happen. Uh, he has said that if there is another Back to the Future film, it must feature Christopher Lloyd and Michael J. Fox. And while Christopher Lloyd has agreed that he would go back and play Doc Brown again, he would only do it if Michael J. Fox went back to do Marty McFly. It's debatable if, Marty, if, if Michael J. Fox could actually do that with the, his health condition. Now, he's not exactly in the best of health with Parkinson's disease. Uh, whether or not he could stand up to the rigour of making a film like a Back to the Future again is debatable. We can but hope that it will come off and they will do another one. Although what they could do with the, the idea is anyone's guess. The original film, it stands up as an individual film in its own right perfectly well. The third film stands up by itself perfectly well. The second film a lot of the time feels like a filler and it's not as good as the other two. But overall, as a trilogy, it works very, very well. Considering the fact as well, the miracle that the second and third films were never actually intended to ever be made. It would be interesting to see a fourth Back to the Future film, but equally it could be a major, major mistake unless there is some completely original way of doing it. I wonder if that would be possible, to be honest with you. Um, but, you know, there you go. This is Hollywood, this is films, and as I've said before, nothing surprises me in films anymore. This is Sean McKeon, and closing down the Classics Capsule again. Uh, until next time, thanks for watching. <laughs>